So, um, as you know, WebGL is a cross-browser standard that is implemented by uh, Apple Safari, Microsoft uh, Edge, Mozilla's Firefox, and Google's Chrome. Uh, and so recently, Edge did support WebGL version 2. Um, and then recently, Microsoft announced that they were switching Edge's browser engine from Edge HTML over to Chromium, which has got to be the most drastic way of supporting WebGL version 2 that I've ever heard of. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a representation from the other browsers besides Chrome, so we'll just uh, introduce ourselves. So my name is Ken. I work on the Chrome's WebGL implementation, and I'm also the WebGL Working Group Chair. I, I'm Kai. I'm Kai. I'm Kai. I'm Kai. I'm I'm Austin. I'm also WebGL. Pump it up, guys. I don't know how to do that. Can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear right, you. Just fine. Yell really loud. All right, so um, I think we'll give a brief update. Uh, so those of you who attended Chronos Developer Day yesterday are going to be disappointed. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to write new slides. But uh, by way of introduction, you may have heard of uh, a physically based rendering engine called Filament, or properly pronounced Filament, as it was written by folks from France. <coughs> And uh, here it is running in WebAssembly in the browser on top of WebGL2 on a Chromebook, no less, and it's super fast. Um, you can get this, it's open source, it's really cool, and it implements all the latest specific based rendering techniques. And here is Wolfenstein from ages ago running ray trace on top of WebGL. So you can see reflections in the spheres. Uh, and they figured out ways of shoehorning this sort of functionality into a fairly old now uh, version of WebGL. So um, please, all these slides are online. You can get them right now. They're linked off Chronos' WebGL uh, with you. So by way of brief update, we're still working on adding important new features and extensions to WebGL 2. Intel's web graphics team from Shanghai has uh, invested a ton of work and they have compute shaders working on the web. Amazing. Uh, so, at this point in Chrome Canary dev channel, you can turn on this, uh, this implementation on Windows and Linux. Command line flags are listed for you in the slides, helpfully. Uh, and you can write compute shaders today and get the results into WebGL so you can do entirely GPU-based amazing visualizations. So please try it out. This is the way forward for graphics on the web. And any time that you invest in these compute shaders is well spent. They will be forward compatible with whatever the next specification for web graphics is. Shaders now compile and link in parallel. So you don't block your application's main thread. Again, thanks to Intel very much. Um, so Austin and Kai implemented amazing new multi-draw extensions that allow better geometry matching. Maybe one of you two would like to speak about this. 
Uh, multi -draw, the multi-draw extensions let you just batch draw calls together, um, and it gets very fast because you can find UBO, index into it, and sometimes it's like 50 times faster or more. Yeah, it was pretty surprising that there were this large performance gains still to be had in the browser and the JavaScript extension, but this was a fantastic work uh, and great job carrying forward. This will this will be supported everywhere WebGL is. WebGL version one and two on every platform. So just uh, take a look at it. The draft extensions are there now. You can achieve maybe like three to six x speed ups on draw call heavy apps. Intel's working on faster video to WebGL uploads, and that's coming soon. Some other big news is that if you have a C++ code base and you try compiling to the web using WebAssembly, now you can use threads and they work with WebGL. So you actually can do real multi-threaded big you know, game engines on the web sandboxed in every browser, little asterisk, like not every browser has any thread functionality turned on yet, but we're getting there. But um, it's going to be shipping in Chrome 74. So this is amazing, and again, if you have big C++ code bases, please uh, try it out. So that having been said, I'd like to thank all of the regular WebGL work group attendees who put in just a tremendous amount of work advancing the specification. You know, all colleagues here, uh, colleagues not here, and our, our valued colleagues over in Shanghai who have um, devoted a significant amount of engineering resources toward advancing these specs that we all know and love. So. We've got a great show for you today. Uh, we have six amazing speakers on a uh, range of products, and um, they're, they're all going to blow your socks off. And we're going to try to end at a reasonable hour so we can have time to socialize and show other demos after. So that having been said, um, any, any questions about <coughs> the state of the ecosystem? Anything we can answer? Do I bind my uniforms before my merchant's attributes? It's the summer solstice and full moon. Something about full moon? And some, uh, sorry, spring equinox. Uh, spring equinox, okay. Okay, well, that, that's, that's not really what GL related, but you know, we won. Okay, so uh, do we have a play canvas here? Here's the topic. Okay, great. So we'll just get right started right now. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See, I was going to dive straight in, but then I realized that you know, maybe not everyone knows what Playcamps is, so I better introduce Playcamps itself. Um, <clears throat> we have been coming to the WebGL meetup since probably 2013. We're a WebGL web first game engine and rendering engine, uh, entirely browser based. Our entire toolset is in the cloud, collaborative editing. And um, you can build all these kind of awesome things. This is all built with Play Canvas, uh, from games to 3D visualization to kind of tech demos, um, <clears throat> simple and complicated. Uh, so what I'm here to talk about is just a few of the latest updates um, that we've made in the last year since I was last year or when we was last year. Um, and we didn't have time to do slides, I kind of just built a demo in the play canvas so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start off in, in, I think April this year, we hit version 1.0, which uh, I think deserves a bit of a celebration. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think it was long overdue, but it really was just kind of reflecting the stable API that we decided was at a point that you know we weren't going to significantly break it anymore, um, and so yeah, that was a big milestone for us. Uh, and then a lot of the other stuff I'm going to talk about here is kind of 2D and UI based stuff. Um, I hope that the demo I showed, that the web page that I showed at the start showed you, like we do a whole lot of really high end 3D stuff, but actually a lot of the work we've been doing over the last 12 months has been focused on uh, 
Um, some, of, some of the higher end designer and artist led tools for game developers in particular. So, for example, buttons. Uh, made out of groups. So you can build user interfaces really easily and run them in WebGL. Uh, masks, so that you can do masking UIs. Uh, it's going to be a lot like this. <laughs> I don't know if you know what nine slicing. Everyone's a game developer. They'll know what nine slicing is. Nine slicing is where you can resize elements like this, and they kind of smoothly resize. You can see the layout group working as well there. Just like really, really useful stuff for people building actual games. And you don't give them this stuff, and they they go mad with like having to implement it themselves. So we've done all that. This is all integrated into the editor. So you can just um, you can just kind of right click, add buttons and scroll views and stuff like that. Uh, speaking of which, scroll views, proper scrolling using masks, all works on mobile. Again, not super sexy, but really, really useful for people. Um, localization tools, again, like a productized version of localization tools. You didn't come here thinking you were going to hear about localization. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we've had, for a long time, we've had uh, multi-channel sign distance field text rendering, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, we, this year, we've added drop shadow and outline to that. So single draw pool, you can just add um, inside the editor. Um, <laughs> You can just add like outline and drop shadows and stuff like that. It's you know, super powerful stuff. Super useful. Okay, back on to rendering. Uh, batching. We added batching natively in, uh, well, into the deep into the engine support. So any graphical component you put into Play Canvas, be that a model or now one of the UI elements, you can just enable batch groups on that. So you can say these things are all going to be pretty similar. They share the same materials or textures. And what? What looks like 16 cactuses, cacti, is if I use the one with respect to JS, <laughs> you can see it's actually just one portal doing all of that. And that comes from. 16 element individual models in Play Canvas uploading elements and stuff like that. So again, like optimization work that um, makes people's lives easier. Sprites, 2D support. We did traditionally a 3D engine. We added um, support for 2D graphics, um, including a full texture sprite, uh, texture atlas editing tool, so you can do. Uh, with preview of the animations and stuff like that. So, uh, for those people building 2D games or 2D tools, uh, 2D tools, 2D tools, 2D tools that's really useful. GLTS support. This will hopefully be a popular one. We have, we don't have it in the engine just yet. But we do have a fully compliant web GL, uh, sorry, GLTF2 loader and, and rendering, obviously, um, support for Play Canvas. Uh, the plan this year is to roll that into proper engine support so that we will have native kind of drag and drop, use GLTF, drop an FBX in, it will run the GLTF, uh, sorry, a GLV, but GLTF in the engine. Um, so that's going to be super exciting. And then a little summary of just what we did this year. That's really valuable. Um, 41 releases since version 1.0, hundreds and hundreds of performance improvements. We spent a lot of this year doing performance improvements. Um, the version control system was a big shift this year. I'll show it off quickly. We have branching, checkpointing, diff, everything uh, that you would need to be a professional large scale team working in play capitals for your projects. Uh, we don't have PNG preview, but we don't. <coughs> um, 
And then I talked about UI system sprites for asset bundling, so you can reduce the number of requests you need to make. And that is everything for me. Thank you very much. See the version control in there that he totally glossed over? <laughs> you have like a shared editing environment that, and by the way, Andrew, uh, yeah, yeah. You've know, got all your, your uh, collaborators editing the same scene, and you can checkpoint things in the verge that changes between them. Yeah. Real time editing. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Real, real time, it's a real time editing environment for those that didn't know, like Google Docs style 3D editing environment. Plus, Branches and checkpoints and version control all just seem to be in the You should check it out. <laughs> and it's small, fast, runs on every platform. So, okay, so uh, next up is uh, Andrew Best from Toyota Research. And uh, last year you might have seen some really cool video of. Uh, autonomous cars driving through like four worlds and showing point clouds and LiDAR data and stuff. I assume that you're going to be showing us some. Yeah. Some it's similar. Okay, similar. Okay. Similar. So, I mean, some improvement over what you've seen before. Um, cool. So, first, thanks very much for inviting us to speak. Um, I really appreciate it. So, I'm Andrew Best, I'm a research scientist with the driving simulation team. I work under Vangelis. Travis is over there. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about today a little bit is some of the tools that we're using to, to help us visualize AV data. Um, Primarily with CZMJS and in WebGL. So, uh, just a quick, very brief overview of Terry and Lance. So, you've probably seen this before if you've seen Mandela's speak. I stole it from him, sorry. But uh, we're a research lab owned by Toyota. We do research in, in a variety of areas, including autonomous driving, robotics, and advanced material discovery um, and development. So, and shameless plug, we are also hiring. So, if you like anything you see or you think you want to help us develop the future of autonomous vehicles or robotics, Talk to us after. Um, brief overview of our mission. I'm just going to read this one. So, Toyota's TRI's mission is to improve the quality of human life through advances in artificial intelligence, automated driving, and robotics. So, these are the other missions of the other departments, but I'm going to focus on AVs. So, we help Toyota produce cars in the future that are safer, more accessible, and more environmentally friendly. Um, we have a lot of different jobs that help that we have to focus on to accomplish this goal. So, the DSIM team, the driving simulation team, manages everything in the virtual world around our autonomous vehicle when we're running on the simulator. So we write the behaviors for the other cars that are driving around us, or other traffic participants. We develop the virtual environments. We even assist hardware teams in doing sensor spoofing. So we've got a lot going on. Um, and we always kind of try to focus on different tools for the different jobs that we have. So web tooling meets our needs in a lot of areas, especially data review. So the tools that I'm going to talk about today are a cloud-based log viewer. So this will be an extension of some of the stuff that you've seen before. I'm going to talk about a data collection analysis tool. So this is a tool of analyzing data collection um, for aggregating and displaying map data. And then a scenario creation tool that we use to generate arbitrary virtual scenarios. So that concludes the slides portion. Now I'm going to start firing up some instances of uh, web browsers. So let's hope this goes as I intended to. So the first thing I'll talk about is the log visualizer. Which just requires a quick refresh. That didn't work. This. Oh, yeah. That's not 8,000. This is when you need to thing. Go. All right. Yeah. This is going to take a minute to start out. Um, so, what you're actually seeing is not the video. It's running live on my laptop. Um, but it is probably similar to some of the stuff that you've seen us talk about before. But this visualization tool is using CZML to stream in data that we pulled off the vehicle. So we're actually running this live, or not, not live on a car, but running it actually on, on vehicle data. <laughs> <laughs> so we can turn on and off point loads, we can you know, disable our tiles that we've produced underneath. Uh, something that's important to think about though is we, we're specializing in this data, right? So this is on the surface of the earth somewhere, and we can zoom all the way out. This is data that we collected near our office in Harvard. So we can go all the way in and all the way out. Um, and we can we, we basically can use this to evaluate data without having to download it. So one of the things that this one of the problems this has really solved for us is that logs are enormous. We've got gigabytes and gigabytes of point cloud data, we've got camera data, we've got other data coming in from the vehicle. So if we have a behavior that we think we're interested in, a workflow pre this tool would have been to download that log, wait for that log to download, wait for that log to download, and then figure out it wasn't what you were looking for in the first place. 
So now on ingest, we can actually pull this data in automatically, generate this web view, and then nobody has to download it until they're sure it's data that they care about. So I mean, this is available on thousands of logs uh, that will be driven, and it's, it's, it's helping us a lot. Um, and it, as we move forward, we can continue to integrate new modalities of sensor data. We can figure out, we can get up from our algorithms that we're running, so as long as they're logging data, we can get a whole lot of information without forcing the engineer to download a log, again, just to discover it's not something that they want. So I'm going to kill that browser, which will probably stop the streaming and start at the next one. So a brief overview of the next thing I'd like to talk about real quick um, is a data collection analysis tool. And I realize not in the AV space, I should preface this a little bit. So one of the big problems a vehicle has when it's driving through the world is figuring out where it is, obviously. Um, we're really good at that as humans because we have a ton of prior data, but our autonomous vehicles need to be able to use features in the environment to try to figure out where they are. And one technique of doing that is by feature analysis over repeated drives. So we look at all the drives that we're taking in an area, we can analyze the data that we've collected and, and start to notice consistent features that we're seeing across drives. So this tool that I'm going to show you now is something that we developed to help us do just that. So this is actually using Uber's H3 spatial index to tell us, so this is a, just some data again that we collected around in Arbor, but this basically gives us an idea of where we collected the most data on different drives throughout the Michigan area. And I can zoom in and see, okay, well, we've got a lot of data here, let's keep going there. Maybe I don't have as much data here, so this might be an area that would be good for us to do some more data collection drives, but I'll keep focusing on this. We'll do a lot of data, show you something. So when we get close, we can actually start to see the data that the vehicles have extracted. So, say you might for the computer a little bit of time. Normally we run this in cloud. <coughs> but as I zoom in, I can actually start to see these are just different feature lines that we found in the environment of this location. And this is also pretty <coughs> specialized. So, if I can get an idea for maybe this is a road sign or a traffic light the car saw, I can start to see these repeated features that the car noticed as it was driving or the things that repeatedly appeared in the environment. And this gives us the ability to look into different features we could be using to localize. So we could say, oh, we're seeing all this interesting data. We're not using that, or we are using it for localization. How can we improve it using this data analysis? And again, it just saves us a lot of time because we can do all of this ingest and all of this processing offline without engineer time wasted, and then just review it when we're ready to see it, which has been very useful for us. So it really, that also solves the problem for us. And the other cool thing that I want to point out about this, um, this is actually using Cesium's tile framework. So the tile set has all the intelligence built into it. The viewer for this app is, is like 20 lines of JS, because the actual spatial indexing is built into the tile set itself. So the lower resolution tiles are the spatial indices, which is really cool. And I should be fair, I did not work on this tool. The developer who did work on the TRI was nice to finish on So this is just one of the other ways that we're using web-based data analysis to speed up our workflows. Now I'll show you one more thing. So this one is just going to take one more second to fire up the other browser. I'm trying to keep the number of browsers I'm running, or the number of JavaScript servers I'm running at the same time low to reduce the chance that my laptop does something I don't. <laughs> okay, this will be the hardest tool to demonstrate without it also viewed on my screen. But this is a, a scenario editing tool that we use when we're doing some unit testing in different scenario generation. It looks like it does a the actual data server. One second. Of course, this is always the case. Uh, this worked. Oh, there we go. Okay, so one of the things we can do is adjust LiDAR maps. So let's go to this map. We can adjust LiDAR maps and spatialize them in the world. So again, data collected around Grand Arbor office. It's going to be a common theme. And we can use this to look at features of the road network and actually lay out, you know, arbitrary paths that we might want the autonomous vehicle to drive. So I'm going to call this. AV car. And just add this to the scene. Unfortunately, the resolution of my laptop is very small. It's kind of hard to see what this tool looks like when you run it on something that doesn't have such a tiny screen. But I can start laying out a path. The car's going to drive over here, maybe. And I'll finish that. Make that view car. Then I can actually see it driving around a little bit. Um, and what we basically use an interchange format with this tool. So we can lay out very simple scenarios, or even more complex scenarios, save it up to the interchange format. And we're working on pipelines to enable that to support variations. So 
we take a scenario, we queue it up, we save it out, and then we've got the necessary knobs and tuning to actually uh, do interesting variations of it. And I'll show you one more thing with this that is pretty cool. Um, if I can find my mouse first. I'll just reload this page. I'm going to have to try to get the file that to work. So there we go. I'm going to bring it over here. This is just too fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it back before I hit go. So just it. Okay, so what I just want to show you one, real quick is one of the other ways that we can do data analysis, we, we can actually extract log data straight from the car into a format that we can load into the web viewer so that we can edit these scenarios on the fly. So um, log data, I'm going to grab a couple of cars out of the data. And go ahead and bring it back so I can find the load button. It's got resolutions just. So go. There we go. So now I can actually see that's oh, no, I don't have the button. That's good. Resolution is too small, but I can actually fly in and see what the car was seeing on its drive. So oh, let me change the we go ahead the button. Oh, uh -oh. Um, that's atypical. <laughs> 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 it's the trouble with my You're giving people a real glimpse of the world. So, yeah, that is actually quite rare when it's running in the cloud, but my laptop unfortunately just doesn't have the power to do this. So, I will just show you an example of something that we use. So, if we get data in from the vehicle, we can also do interesting things like lay out a couple of tracks. And then maybe decide that we don't really like that. So we can scrub and say, okay, well, like right here, really wish that that would have done something different. So let me just split that. Now I've got two vehicles. Come on. But anyway, so now I've got two of them, and it looks like it's recoverable, which is nice. Um, yeah, so we can split paths, we can do different trajectory designs in this tool. And it's still early stages, but the big focus is, again, it allows us to take data that we're getting in formats we can't visualize, we can't really understand super well, and then put them into a format that we can see, we can visualize, and contextualize much easier, which gives us the ability to produce artificial scenarios much faster, or to do log playback in a much easier way. So that's it. That's what I want to show you guys today, just some of the tooling that we're working on at Cesium. Um, thanks very much for your time, and if you have any questions, you can talk to me. We are still sharing, as we were 10 minutes <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That's a cool use of WebGL, but I hadn't anticipated when I started working on it some years ago. So, uh, awesome job. I hope that it's been working and that the shader compilation errors are. I hope that you're reporting this bugs to the browser. Um, I can be honest, they're extremely rare. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All we hear about is the bugs. You know, and they're hey, our app was running great, it's really fast. Okay, so uh, Alma and Sketchpad, they've been with us since the beginning. Uh, you started working on uh, WebGL, the minute that it came out, that you Seven eight years now, and you like the number one model site on the web on the internet. Power of positive thinking and strong engineering. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Amos, founder and CEO of uh, Sketchdown. So, for those who are not familiar with where platforms publish and find 3D models online. And so I'm just going to share a few of the updates since uh, last GDC a year ago. So just a few milestones. Uh, over the past year, we've passed 3 million 3D models published on the platform by 2 million users, and we've passed 1 billion page views, thanks to WebGL. Uh, and 80% of those big views are model views, and most of them are through so embeds all across the internet. That's really cool. Um, we released a store a year ago, so it's a marketplace to buy and sell 3D assets. 
This is sort of just turned one year old. Uh, we launched it in January. And within a year uh, of the store, we have about 50,000 assets, a bit more now. More than 70% of our sellers sell, which, which is the previous stats. And we have over 100 sellers of past thousand dollars in net revenue. This is just a really uh, cool way to help creators make money out of their work at this case. We also launched a download API pretty much a year ago. And so we are using GLTF to so convert any file you upload to SketchUp to GLTF. So it was 200,000 uh, 3D models available uh, under Creative Commons licenses. And we're starting to integrate the download API very much everywhere. The goal is to be kind of a, a search bar for the 3D world and bring the SketchUp library anywhere where you need the assets. We have in more than 30 integrations, uh, including places like Spark AR by Facebook. So that uh, the screenshots you can see, what it has, uh, many AR like the apps like Torch is a it's a part, it's pretty cool. And we're adding two things. Uh, one is uh, the ability to download your own models, because until now we we're only exposing uh, models available for free download, but a lot of people use this kind of as their Dropbox or their free work. And so now that we're able to search their, their own profile in the API to Bringing their own models, even if they are not set to downloadable, and then download whatever you, you purchase on the SketchUp store through the API. We released uh, SketchUp Massive, which is a new pipeline that uh, supports files of an unlimited size. Uh, and so, this is an example of a file of 80 million polygons. Uh, it's a way to actually type the data uh, and just show you whatever you're looking at. And it means we can uh, yeah, support many, many more uh, free files. And so here it's loading. Uh, it's <laughs> uh, right now we really support Vertex Color, which are very close to really uh, uh, texture support and point cloud support. So this is a pretty cool uh, castle in uh, threads captured by a uh, play. Not too wrong. We also invested a lot in our uh, viewer API, which is a thing you can do on top of the SketchUp viewer outside the SketchUp. Uh, we update the API pretty much every quarter, but we keep adding new functionalities uh, so that you can do more custom things with, with the viewer and the API for content. Uh, it's between triggering animations and, and cool things like that. Uh, so, just an example, we do with uh, Oji, with the car configurator, so uh, pretty basic, but so things like uh, customizing the color, uh, opening the doors, and uh, uh, inside the car, customizing the inside of the car. And so, yeah, uh, exposing this with the API is really easy for any developer to use that type of uh, configuration or uh, with minimal effort. And then uh, we have a lot of features in the editor. Uh, one of them that has been super successful with our uh, ground shadows. And so it feels very basic, but uh, uh, here is a shoe with and without ground shadow. It's a without, it's kind of a floating shoe. <laughs> and with, it's a grounded shoe. And so just to show you uh, in the editor, we support both uh, baked uh, AO and then uh, uh, real time shadow. And so real time shadow is what we use. Make your model is animated, uh, and you can like, uh, set up a lot of, uh, like two colors and parameters, and then uh, big tail, which is somewhat like Twitter. Uh, it's big tail. What's cool is that we we generate a, a texture file for the big tail, and so you're going to get it from downloading uh, if you download the file. Um, Clear code, another very like, you know, niche feature, but really cool for some use cases. Uh, it's actually cars, and so here is an example of a Ford car. And so, oops. Um, here is a model with the clear code, and then without the clear code, just as a seal. Uh, I don't know if you can see this pretty 
uh, this is all like uh, varnish style effects, uh, which is really nice on, on a car or on a candy or things like that. Um, Bone Inspector, which is something we added to our uh, model inspector, so we released our model inspector uh, a year ago, and then the Bone Inspector, so that's a little hamburger menu available in the model. And then the Bone Inspector, once you inspect the bones uh, of an animated model, you can also uh, see the bone influence, which is cool. And so. <laughs> Typically, when you are buying a model, it's a common feature. And then you expose many other things, uh, both in, in 2D and 3D, uh, for the uh, inspector. Um, screen space reflection is a pretty cool rendering feature. Uh, actually, a post process feature. And so, here's an example with screen space. And we have screen space, so you can see the effects on the floor. Uh, and, so and then I think that's the last one. Anisotropy, not sure how you see that. Uh, it's another very uh, niche but cool feature, and so it's with and without, and so it's really for. Uh, uh, Things like hair or uh, metallic surfaces, as we found. You see this? Yeah. Uh, just with little uh, curves uh, on the wall. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Awesome stuff. Thank you, Alma. I mean, Sketchfab's been adding, Ricardo, uh, this is one. Uh, Sketchfab's been adding um, visual effects to their render for years, and uh, a lot of their senior staff came to the demo scene, and they showed the rest of us how to do it, how to do these shaders on the web, fast, small, cheap, and so that they ran everywhere. And uh, Ricardo is another alumnus of the demo scene, and is working on 3JS, the premier WebGL library on the internet for a number of years. And uh, so it's due to, to his persistence that we have uh, such an awesome ecosystem out there. So, uh, one second. Please stand by. Alright, so we're going to see uh, two 3JS contributors today, Olivier and Jordan Santel, who is somewhere here. Can you vanish? Well, hopefully, hopefully he'll be back um, to show you some amazing stuff, including updates to their physically based uh, rendering material. Uh, let's take a blind one. This seems to be uh, running. Uh, Seems to be like a, a common pattern between all the talks. So how long we've been doing this? <laughs> and when I was preparing the talk, I also didn't know exactly how to start, but I uh, somehow found this. Well, like a friend of mine is doing this uh, funny for jail sites, and this is the last one that he did for a friend. It works.
and eventually when I reach the like solving that problem, they're like when you set problems that keep going for which you and then like you move to your system and stuff. Uh, so for those of you like the use use that this is how like and use or like the and use use that so quick. You can see more is when I stab it. And I'll go on this stuff but uh, and then trying to like you know work on weekends and see like person is uh somebody and that would be one, but I'm not going to do that. Alright, so I usually like to uh, show you the studies that people are doing to kind of in, somehow like encourage the kind of work set. Like, I know the, the, what, what keeps me going is to see the kind of project people are doing. So I show, uh, yeah, the kind of presentation, but these the, the kind of things that the tool allows, or the library allows people to do. Uh, so I'll start with the, this one, which is for the third year, have seen it. Uh, this guy is actually has, is not really using much of the tree, but he has to put it down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a uh, Super Mario with like a simulation. <laughs> I actually exported more of the levels. Another one is, I mean, that's kind of like funny one. That's why I this one. This is a perfect example that a lot of people are using it, so they're adding this kind of headers to the websites. So in this one, you can basically like a nicer image, but like a, you can move your the camera around, you can see the reflections. Um, in a photo, but then this is just like a normal um, HTML website. So it's just like a fancy headers um, type of design. Uh, oh, this one. Uh, so I think like probably like I think this one is two years old already. Um, but this year we've been seeing like this pattern being used more and more. And more. So so people are trying to do uh, this is actually somehow HTML, but you can like transition between pages with this kind of fancy effects. Uh, you know like, when you go to all the projects that is goes into all these elements. So somehow they're trying to use to see the benefits of like using GPU and using a work field to do things that they cannot do with CSS. Uh, and this is something that at the time like, when they did uh, it was kind of mind-blowing, but probably it was a little bit uh, ahead of time, but people didn't know very well how this was working. Uh, but like I said, like this year we're trying to see more people doing this kind of thing. So this goes on another one, for instance. Um, that's the same thing. Like they, I think they still check the HTML, but they use how like, to render a part of like some some part of it. So in this case, you can move from from uh, especially the distortion image thing. Like there, you can see the different image. They just distort the image and while they fade the other image, but also you can uh, go towards. You can change project by dragging another thing. But this is, again, this is the national stage. Somehow I'm happy with it. Uh, and I think this one is kind of the last one in that kind of example, where it loads as, a, as if it was like a normal uh, HTML page with even a video on it. Uh, but it adds this, uh, this gear. On top of it, so you can interact with it. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the text as it was. In the, this, this kind of thing that you can now, it's a thing that you won't be able to do with CSS. And, and I'll have some things inside the public for you. This one is also interesting that people are trying to print this project, the uh, React B fiber. I'm not, I don't know much about React, but these guys. Basically, as far as I'm telling you, doing some sort of like you can use React to like create these scenes, but no way it like it is React to like React Native. So somehow he's done a render or he's just rendering in three to let him done. So it'll be interesting whenever if, if this React thing catches up. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see whenever like 
sometimes like there are things that you want to do. Uh, there are going to be faster using web BL directly than now, like CSS or HTML. So it's interesting if people will end up adopting these kind of things. Or maybe like what will happen to it? It's an interesting discussion to have. Uh, right. So some I mean, there's, a, there's a ton of things to do that happen uh, in coming years. So I'm going to try to uh, summarize all, uh, some of them. Uh, so most of them are, are kind of uh, systematic ways. So for instance, uh, uh, until last year. Uh, I basically will release the version whenever I thought it was ready or whenever it, like, it was not too long. So, but it, it felt better to have to be able to release. Uh, now that I was more invested in it, they, they decided to release one version at once. So at least the people that are using it, uh, because we don't use a semantic version, we just like, use the existing number. Uh, by releasing every month, they know that if we break something, the next month will be fixed. Uh, because basically we're going to maintain like, many, many versions at the same time. But like, which is why I managing to like uh, do that, like, so that the release cycle is more expected than people you know what's expected. Usually, usually it's kind of a very, very last of the month. Uh, usually, it's supposed to be the last uh, Wednesday of the month. Uh, and, and that managed to, that was at the beginning of, of 2018, and managed to do it about uh, the whole year. So we did with both companies. We also looked at the milestones. So basically, you can see that for every Every month we have like around uh, from like 180 at some point to to only 100 or like 70 PR merge. So it's, uh, it's done in a way that like people can submit PR very quickly and then them as soon as they can. And it's, it's, that's the development process that I do have as well. Um, another thing with the cover render, cover render was the first render that we did have uh, was basically who was before what GL. Uh, was a thing. So you basically use the canvas to the uh, content to the uh, in canvas. Uh, but the problem was that people, specifically people were like light on um, It was on the canvas, and then he, they kept like using this example on the website. Uh, it was like last year, so it, it, it felt sad that people were, you know, we, we decided to like go rid of the, of the render because people were misusing it for like some example that were like nice, and then we forwarded them to what you um, Sorry, Jordan. Where is Jordan? Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, another one doing localization. Uh, Chinese, for some reason, the uh, community uh, requested to be able to, uh, if they were able to uh, localize the documentation on the, on the editor, so if something I spent some time last year, so now it's funny to have documentation that I can read. <laughs> but I use basically enable the documentation that I that I was building, and also on the editor way. They did the localization for all the editor. Basically, embracing them and somehow like, you know, we can have the support to them in Chinese, but uh, we can do it as much as we can in Chinese. And that are also open to any other community that wants to have Spanish or or any other community to do it. We did some of them looking for support. Uh, for those of you that don't, don't know, I'm looking at the uh, volumetric screen type, which basically they do something like uh, four by uh, five renders in every frame, and then they slice it, and then they, in this screen you're, you're basically able to see like the, the object in by moving your head. Many people do this. Uh, so I just optimized it to, to do like an optimal render for it. Uh, I'll skip here. <laughs> and also, like JavaScript models. <laughs> It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it works by the way. Um, and JavaScript modules uh, is something that people have been asking. So now you're able to uh, import the library directly. Like, uh, like you don't have to import like the JavaScript directly. You can have the, the suite of the, the JS, the JS. You can import the source directly on your page and use that. Uh, and that sample works on, on any, any more uh, browser support modules. Uh, TypeScript is also something that people will be requesting a lot. They want to have a version of the, of the library that uses TypeScript. But eventually, we, get, we ended up uh, adding like a, a description, how, how do you say it, like a description in TypeScript. So basically, it's like a .h file in C++. You'll see that describes what's inside the, the JavaScript file and what the word text. So that allows them to type TypeScript to be able to use it. And one of the things, and also I didn't hear, uh, 
GLTF loader keeps improving and down into the and yeah. And uh, the last thing, like a uh, bonus thing, is uh, with the, uh, the editor uh, now passes for uh, PWA. So if you go to the editor now, you'll have the option here to install the PS editor and download for like Mac, Windows, and Linux. So now you can you can head with it on the application. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how exciting is to build the PR shaders. Hello. Hi, I'm Jordan. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about energy compensation and PGS and changes. Uh, we were playing around recently. So a few months ago, uh, myself and some colleagues from the Chrome DevXR team uh, released the model here. It's a web component uh, that displays GLTF models. And the idea was to uh, easily and beautifully uh, render models as easy as it is with images and things. Uh, and when we started this, we wanted to we wanted to be beautiful out of the box, with, you know, any arbitrary model, you know, tall order. So we started with uh, comparing to uh, Filament's GLTF viewer. Now this picture isn't really doing the PGS justice. Uh, half the problem is kind of seeing, setting the scene, lighting, um, and all that to proper like knobs. The other half was uh, there's still something missing, some oomph. Um, and it turns out I do not have the vocabulary at the point for uh, indirect diffuse lighting. So I just heard something called the furnace test. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. Uh, the idea is to uh, figure out whether or not your rendering is uh, preserving energy correctly. So there's a bunch of metal spheres in this scene uh, holding the metallic objects. In a uniform lit scene, all of the partial color of white. And if 3GS was properly preserving energy, we should be able to see none of these. Now it looks, uh, that's supposed to be an arrow. Um, so on the far side, we have fully rough materials, and on the left side is uh, fully smooth materials. So as the roughness increases, we're losing energy somehow. So it turns out, uh, 3GS's uh, ERDF model uh, is only single scattering. So it only uh, predicts, I don't know if predict is the right word. It's like chaotically predicts where, what light happens to rough materials. Now if we only stimulate the first scattering, uh, we could lose it within like some kind of uh, nook and crane of the model. Um, and this is from the beautiful filament documentation, if you haven't seen it, it's the best documentation seen on PDR. So what we need to do for 3GS is simulate additional scatterings of the model, so the, everything beyond the initial. So using a Fidesz Aguilera's paper that just uh, was published in January, I think, um, it was a technique to describe how to do that, this looks on approximation, already inside of 3GS. I'm glossing over that very quickly. Um, so again, this is what it looked like uh, previously, and this is version 100. Um, and with energy compensation, this is what it looks like. It's the least interesting. Uh, uh, this actually works so well. I had a bunch of iframes behind each one of these slides, and I didn't realize it until my uh, computer shut down. <laughs> so uh, some quick shots. Uh, and this is a very different talk than I thought I would give this morning, but I'll get into that in a second. So on the left is R100, and the right is uh, R103 with the changes. Uh, metallic objects are on the top, and uh, dielectric, which is a fancy word for not metallic, is on the bottom. So you can see in the upper right uh, of each of these shots, the, the fully metallic and rough materials uh, with the change, the upper right sphere is, has much more light. It, it's uh, preserving much more energy. But then I found out something uh, after playing around a little bit, there was some error. So this third shot is from this morning, and I can't quite yet explain it. Um, but it turns out uh, the initial fix had some extra grazing flow around the outside, and we thought that was wrong. And, but after running that for the light furnace test, and after talking with uh, the main guy from the filament and you know, confirming my standard, uh, 
The bottom row, the sort of fully dielectric, again, bottom row, uh, objects are also fully invisible because if you can picture like a fully metallic uh, object, like a mirror or something, it's not absorbing any light, mostly, hardly any light. Uh, and same with a fully uh, non metal object that is, regardless of roughness, it should uh, completely reflect the light. Approximately. <laughs> so, um, the far right is my change from this morning. So, uh, if anyone really knows what this stuff was, it's far right. Um, and so, here's another shot of maybe a more uh, real model. Now, this is a fully uh, metal and rough object. So, you can see in the middle, actually, I don't know if you can see it from there, but in the middle, you can see there's a lot of grazing uh, on the statue's face on the white side. A lot of white grazing. And on the far right, well, this change this morning is a little bit more warmer and less bright. Because we can see here how much more bright uh, it was and currently, and how much darker maybe it should be. I don't know. And so here's another shot of uh, a few months ago, and as of this morning, can you tell from there? Okay, cool. Great to hear. Um, so certainly back to uh, Model Viewer. Uh, inside of Model Viewer, uh, someone from Chris Joel, um, the DevXR team, uh, has a whole fidelity testing suite inside of that repo. Testing uh, filament, um, Model Viewer, what else? A few other things. Um, just a way, as a way to be able to common platform to test these different kind of uh, PBR implementations across browsers. And there's some uh, one similar with the Chromos team working on that as well. So we're getting pretty close. And that was all to say, this is a lot, a lot of the stuff is new to me, so I'd love to talk about any of this. You can look at what spirit the harmonics are, DFGs, BRDFs, great, let's talk. Um, we'd love to have your help and maybe we would, but uh, we're ready for it. Thanks. That bug fix, those two bug fixes, that is, uh, one from this morning, have like improved the quality of all three, well, most 3D rendering on the web, just like that, which is awesome. Now, it's not to say that 3JS is the only game in town, because Babylon.js folks are here and talk about their uh, system in GLT at their board. Um, and I mean, they're um, a relative newcomer to the WebGL space. But they've already uh, got a ton of features in their render, and it's super fast. And they've built some world-class tools in Spectre.js, for which we are eternally grateful. So please uh, tell us uh, what's new. Sure. Hello, Hi, my name is Gary. Um, from my... um, I usually talk about GLTF. Today I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to give a little update on that. Now you probably already heard about it. Uh, but for those of you who haven't heard, uh, I'm going to give a little quick summary. So, Babylon is an open source free framework from the web written in TypeScript. Our philosophy is that developers should type the minimal amount of code um, for every single feature. So, we strive to uh, have really high performance and uh, maintain backwards compatibility. And uh, many products already use uh, Babylon.js, as you can see up here. So, uh, just to warn you, on time, we have a lot of videos here, so we're going to see a lot of videos. So here's a video of how I need some from. So if you want to 
uh, try these out for yourself. Uh, here are some of the links. Uh, yeah, I'll have uh, these, these slides that we really build. So uh, we have a 4.0 release coming out soon, uh, at the end of April. And uh, here are some of the highlights of the new things that are happening in 4.0. We have a new inspector, which allows you to plug uh, C. We have uh, some new feature for PDR, uh, like energy contribution to a refill. Clear code sheet. We also have uh, uh, ESX module support now to support tree shift. So we'll see that in a second. Uh, and uh, physics integration with CamelJS and a whole bunch of optimization from various things. So again, new videos. <laughs> new inspector. <laughs> Right there. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, some new things we've been working on. Uh, 
So all the draft API from the WebXR has been shared. And then we've implemented it to just to see if it works or not. Uh, also, some new extensions that Ken has talked about as well. Uh, and let me show you a little bit about that. So, WebXR is working now uh, with uh, Batmo. Uh, you can use it to place objects in AR. Here's a scene. Also, in VR. And that's all working. Uh, we will continue to work with the WebXR guys to make sure it's all works. MultiView is another extension that can be um, It's here. Um, it helps to improve frame rate, as you can see in this uh, demo here. If you turn on MultiView, uh, the frame rate increases. And, uh, take a look at the profiler. You can see in the MultiView version, enabled version, there's one, one less frame rate. So that's why it's improving the frame. Another one is the parallel chair compile, one that Ken did talk about. And uh, this one does improve uh, also a bit. Uh, it's pretty hard to see uh, the comparison between the videos because it's just a little bit that happens. So I didn't show a side by side comparison. But what's happening here is the, uh, the boom box is spinning. And then while it's spinning, I'm adding a green light, which then causes the shader to be compiled. And that's what you're seeing that pitch there. So again, with the profiler. Now this one, there's an improvement. You can see there's definitely improvement. It goes from about 75 uh, milliseconds to 48 milliseconds. Now this is with the profile turned on, and it's on my demo machine. Uh, but you can see it still takes quite a bit of time, so it's not completely done. We want it to be under 60 milliseconds when it gets in draw. So we'll see what we do. So now uh, I'm going to try and do some live demos of some debugging tools. So we've been trying to uh, improve some of the tools for debugging. So you saw just spectral hands while we're here. Let me show you a little bit more. So this is the back on sandbox. It's, it's for loading uh, different models of you. And uh, spectral.js is if you don't know, is a browser extension that allows you to uh, debug WebGL. So it's similar to other graphics debuggers where you want to capture a frame. So let me do that. I think you already saw this earlier, but this is the uh, the view of a bunch of the screenshots, and this is all the commands on the green side of WebGL. So if I click on one of the draw calls, you can see all the state. Or everything that is being sent, including uniforms, attributes, textures. Right. You can even click on one of these shaders and look at the shader, protect shader, private shader. And something you might not know is that you can actually live edit these shaders and it will instantly read the file. Now, it's not, this doesn't come right out of the box. You do have to make a small modification to your engine to hook it up. But uh, I'll show you this in a second. So this is Spectre.js. And this is, a. Uh, am going to show you what's going on with the GLT debugger in the GSC code. So we've added some capabilities to this as well. And one of the capabilities is, so you can already view uh, this model in different viewers. That's already there. This is but we also added this debug button now. So you can see the same inspector that we saw earlier. It's all hosted inside of the VS Code. And one of the nice integration points is that if I click on this avocado mesh, it will instantly select the correct place in the GLP. <laughs> Another feature. Yeah. We also added a, a new view. And uh, this view is basically showing you the primitives and all the vertices and triangles. But you know, oftentimes you can only see values here. So what if you can see the visual? Now you can. The actual uh, vertices and the actual You can even multi select. I'm going to have to put my mic on. 
Yes. Same thing for triangles. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So now um, I'm going to show you an actual example where I'm going to actually show you what someone gave me a problem and showed me. Uh, I'm going to try to bug it. Uh, one second. I actually need to do this before. One second. Okay, so you can see there's a seam in this in this uh, click here. So I'm going to use both tools to debug what's going on. So first, step your JS. <coughs> one, one small change. I'm going to use the inspector first. Look at the material. I'm going to show you that in the debug view. You can look at the bulk of me. And you can see the view here and see that, hey, there is something wrong with this uh, mole map here. Okay, so now I'm going to use Spectre. Spectre JS. And I'm going to live edit this, uh, this figure. Because, of course, if you're a graphic programmer, something's wrong, and you just want to flip a value, right? Flip values to see if it's all worse. So we're going to do that. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Trade secrets, sir. Okay, so let's try something normal. Well, okay, that did something, but not the right thing. So let's try something. Try the tangent. Okay, that also did something, but still not what we want. Maybe, maybe it's the bi tangent. Look, seems like that's correct. <laughs> Look at that. Everything's fixed. So, something obviously the bi tangent is probably wrong here. So, but I want to verify this for sure. Let's make sure. Okay, so, let's pull the same uh, model into VS Code. So that's the same model that you saw before, and the same problem that you'll see here. And let's look at the actual data using the inspect data. So I'm just going to click on one of these first. Okay. So here's first C0. This is a left-handed portal system. Now, the normal map, I'm pretty sure, is a right handed portal system. So, most likely, uh, whoever created this model uh, has a wrong uh, tangent space. So, I confirmed with the team and said, hey, it looks like maybe this tangent is backwards. And they confirmed, yeah, they accidentally took the W component here, which actually represents the tangent. So, that's how I figured it out. And I sent the report back to them and said, hey, here are all the things that are wrong. So that is uh, how you use both tools to debug an actual issue. Woo. That's it. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, please let me know. And for the next round, here are some links to some of the things you saw. And uh, yeah. Eternally grateful for the development of both Babylon JS and Spectre JS. Um, Spectre JS has saved my own hide in you know, debugging some WebGL bug reports recently. It's, um, it's great that they invested so much time and energy in it, and it's great to see the vibrance of the ecosystem. Speaking of ecosystem, uh, Robert is uh, from Mozilla. He's going to talk, talk to us about um, the ways to collaborate, interact, VR, 
in browser, out of browser, with VR headsets, etc. And all using well, the VR block is built to accomplish that stuff. Everyone, uh, my name is Robert Long. I work at Mozilla on the Hubs team. And here today to talk about Hubs, our new editor spoke, and a few ways you can optimize your 3GS or any projects uh, for WebVR and some of the uh, So we released Mozilla Hubs uh, last April. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Hubs yet, uh, it's a social VR application that runs in your browser. You can go to hubs.mozilla.com today and create a new room with just a single click. Uh, when you create a room, you'll have a link that you can share with your friends, family, or colleagues. You can share that link via Discord, Slack, text message, email, Reddit, wherever you use for your group messaging. So they'll join your room and you can talk, import 3D models, images, and videos. You can even share your uh, your screen or stream live video. And this, we're like streaming Twitch on the TV over there. Uh, so Hubs works with VR on most desktop headsets like the Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, Windows Mixed Reality, as well as standalone headsets like the Oculus Go. And it also works in 2D mode on both PC and on your phone. In fact, the uh, majority of our users actually use Hubs in 2D. So here are some examples of media that you can add to Hubs today. Um, we support importing any GLTF model. Uh, you can paste links in or just drag and drop the files into the browser. Um, and now you can go and search for uh, assets directly inside Hubs itself. So we support Sketchfab and Google Poly and all sorts of things. Uh, so Hubs has a wide variety of robot-based avatars that you can choose from today. Um, but uh, we're also about to add support for skinny robot avatars with your own textures. Uh, if you're familiar with GLTF, these are the same maps as uh, are in GLTF. Uh, so right now we, we store these textures on our servers and then transform the bot uh, file at request time. Uh, to use these textures. And because GLTF is just JSON, it was really easy to implement this feature. Uh, so we provided our users a uh, wrap template with all the different pop parts and their own layers. And it's symmetrical, so they can just open this up uh, in their favorite image editor and paint while mirroring uh, horizontally. So uh, here are a couple examples of some avatars that we've created. Um, it was really interesting watching Jim open this up on his iPad and procreate and just like draw these things. Uh, in fact, Jim's uh, pretty excited about this. He created his own avatar, Jim Bot. <laughs> um, so, in addition to custom skinning, we're also allowing you to upload your own GLTF avatar. Um, the avatar skeleton is uh, roughly based on the high fidelity skeleton. Uh, and we have most of this working right now. Um, we're currently working through some stuff in the GLTF exporter and then uh, getting things packaged up to help people uh, make their own avatars. Uh, if you're curious, uh, it goes out right now. Um, you can find like Blender assets and Photoshop assets in there. Um, and uh, that's being updated regularly. Uh, despite being difficult, we've already seen a couple of our dedicated users create their own avatars. Um, and so we have a variety of pre-made scenes in Hubs right now, um, and we just recently added the Steam browser so that people can browse user-created scenes, uh, and people are already starting to create some pretty interesting things. To help users create this, these environments, we developed our own uh, editor uh, called Spoke. So Spoke can be used to create Hub scenes, from your own GLTF assets or using assets from sites like Sketchfab or Google Poly. It's browser based, uh, but it currently ships as a desktop application. Uh, we're going to be um, releasing a hosted version really soon that will allow you to like just go to your web browser, type in spoke.mozilla.com, and like view this right away. Um, and if you've used Spoke before, you'll notice we just add, we're adding a content browser so you can search for assets 
from places like SketchUp without having to do this. Uh, so leave that. So uh, in addition to models, we also have a wide variety of components. Uh, so you can add lights, set animations, and add behaviors to your scene. Um, all this component data is actually stored in the GLCF uh, scene itself, and then uh, uploaded to our servers, and then uh, loaded as neighboring. Uh, in addition to model, models and components of data, you can add additional media like images and animated GIFs uh, or, or videos and Twitch streams. Uh, you can even add 360 degree videos to your scenes. So, right now we have uh, a bunch of assets on our Skip uh page where you can go and Drag and drop these into spoke today. Um, they're mostly like low poly assets that work really, really well in us. Uh, we, we also have a curated collection of just things that we found that work really well. Uh, so, uh, just in December, we sponsored a, a VR clubhouse design challenge for SketchUp, and it produced a really awesome scene. So, we're, we're hoping that uh, you'll soon be able to remix those scenes and uh, create more. Uh, uh, using um, finally, uh, we, we also built a, a set of architecture models uh, that you can use to build scenes in Spoke. And so we'll be adding that to the editor. Uh, this will enable users who aren't familiar with 3D modeling to build structures and change textures and colors of these pieces. And I personally think like, uh, people who are comfortable with building things in games like The Sims are really going to enjoy this. So uh, once you have your scene, uh, Spoke has a simple flow for publishing to us with just a couple of clicks. Um, when publishing, we, we do a couple of things. We generate a navigation mesh uh, for teleporting. Uh, we add attribution information so everyone gets credited for their work. Uh, we optimize GLTF models. Currently, we're just merging geometries uh, and deduplicating materials. It's pretty neat, but we'll get better in the future. And then it gets uploaded to our servers. Um, here are a few examples of scenes that people have created in Spoke today. A lot of these are using Sketchfab assets, or some of them are their custom assets. And now we'll move on to some of the technical stuff. Um, so, is built on top of A-Frame. Uh, and A-Frame is a great project to get started quickly with WebVR. Uh, it includes things like track controls and an entity component system. Uh, the A-Frame community has created some really awesome projects that we use. So we use A-Frame Superhands, which is created by Paul Murphy, uh, Network A-Frame, which is created by Aiden Lee, and A-Frame Physics System. Uh, and A-Frame itself is built on top of 3GS. So we use a couple libraries from there as well. Uh, so three path lighting also created by Don, and then three master BBH, which is really awesome uh, fast recasting data structure library that we use for speeding up our recasting. That's loved by your notes. So I'm just building up an A-frame kind of. We created a whole bunch of custom components that are all open source. You can go check out today. Um, so right now we're we. Stopped using a lot of the built-in components from uh, A-Frame, so we've created uh, a new GLTF model uh, component called GLTF Model Plus, which, in addition to loading models, also uh, inflates A-Frame communities with that component data from Spoke. That's cool. Um, our scenes are mostly defined in GLTF, not HTML, so that's one difference. And then uh, our image and video. Uh, uh, components are also using uh, media loader and uh, media views components, which are hub specific things for loading media and displaying uh, And then finally, we're also, we also have a new input system that we've been working on, uh, which is the Open XR input mapping API. And it, it just works with a wider range of devices, including like 2D on screen, like joysticks, and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, Apron physics system. Um, we uh, so Apron physics system uses Canon JS by default, and uh, one of our team members, uh, Kevin Lee, 
uh, wrote a new physics server that uses Gamma JS, uh, which is basically a, it's a compiled version of uh, Bolt physics uh, that was compiled with Inscript in uh, to WASM. So we use that. Um, this gives us support for trimeshes, which is really awesome. We use that for our, our scenes and a number of other things. Um, and we are seeing like generally better performance with it, although like if you use a really complex trimesh, it can become the same. So here's some of our physics debugging features and inputs. And so for network A frame, um, we, we use it for, for networking, and uh, by default, it, it comes with uh, an adapter that can either use WebSockets or WebRTC using the e EasyRTC library. Um, so we wrote a, a, another adapter uh, that uses this open source uh, WebRTC library called Janus. Um, and Janus is written in C, super fast, and it's extensible. So um, we wrote a plugin called Janus Plugin as a view, which is written in Rust. And um, it allows us to use Janus as a selective forwarding unit. Um, you don't know what this means. Like I did, I did not know this one for a while. Um, it basically ends up producing upload uh, bandwidth, and uh, it, it has resulted in a bunch of like reliability uh, improvements for peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections. Um, typically, people can connect our our servers easier than they can connect to other peers. Um, and here's some performance optimizations that you may want to consider. So um, in Hubs, the uh, matrix updates and world matrix updates were the hottest part of our code, and they're surprisingly expensive. Uh, when possible, you should be reducing the number of object reviews in your scene. Also note that each A-frame entity also has a uh, free group node on it, so you should probably Reduce the number of A-frames you're using, um, and make sure that you're setting object 3D matrix auto update to false. That's like the biggest one um, for all of your static objects. Um, and in hubs, uh, we actually kind of took this to the extreme. Um, we monkey patched 3 JS and set uh, object 3D default matrix auto update to false, which is by far and above the single scariest line that we have in hubs. Like when we put this on, just on the things broke. It, we're still finding things that break. So it's scary. Um, but um, to, to do this, you, you have to like manually update matrices. Um, and we had to both patch a bunch of functions. You can go check this out on our GitHub today. Uh, it was a lot of work, but it was definitely worth it for the performance. It's like, on the same one headsets, this was night and day. Uh, another thing that's been going on, um, so we've been finding that uh, texture uploads, particularly on VR headsets, uh, have been like a major pain point. So uploading textures to the GPU can often block um, for tens of milliseconds, causing us to drop frames and cause discomfort for users in VR. Uh, this is especially noticeable on the Oculus Gap. Um, one of our coworkers, Takahiro, has been doing some work with the image bitmap loader, uh, which uses the image bitmap API to synchronously decode images uh, and reduce the time that texture uploads block in front. On this uh, slide, you can see a profile um, on the Oculus Go before and after using this decoder. Uh, we still have a long ways to go with making loading GLTF models uh, more smooth on the Oculus Go, but texture uploads were definitely the largest contributor to the long frames. And uh, finally, uh, so some of our early results from using Oculus's implementation of WebGL multi-view extension uh, didn't yield that much of a performance improvement on Oculus Go, which we were kind of surprised by. But uh, then we realized, well, we're not really doing that many problems on uh, Go. So um, we think that using WebGL 2's uniform you know, bar objects will actually result in a little bit better for us. And then, in general, uh, everyone should be reducing the amount of uh, garbage collection that they have in there. Um, one thing that we found was, uh, well, garbage collection itself can cause drop frames. We just might have a long garbage collection uh, on a frame. Uh, but a major garbage collection event can actually 
uh, dispose of gen optimized code and just cause your it causes quite a few different things to just slow down. So, yeah. uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you want to go check out Hubs, you can check it out at hubs.mozilla.com today. Uh, Spoke is on there as well. You can check out all of our code at github.com slash Mozilla Reality uh, on our Twitter. We're also always on Discord if you want to come and talk about what VR or anything like that. Thanks. So that's all we got. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, the slides from the presentations will be posted on Protoss Wiki. I want to thank the Protoss Group for sponsoring this event. A big round of applause to Protoss. <laughs> and, uh, we have the space for another half an hour, so please uh, eat, drink, be merry, mingle. Uh, let's talk about your coaching else. See you until next time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>